Good afternoon. Welcome to the Lord's House this day. A few announcements. First of all, as we do every week, we encourage you to sign in on the fellowship pass towards the central aisle. Also, I'd like to remind you that uh, we have uh, midweek Bible study this week at uh, 11 o'clock. Uh, we're going to be finishing up our study on the book of Psalms, and then we're going to take a break probably for a couple months here in the summer uh, at that point for our midweek Bible study. Catechism class, uh, we're done. So uh, we were going to have a class this week, but uh, however, because uh, Mary and I will be celebrating our 20th anniversary on Wednesday, uh, I figure we'll take her out to dinner, and that's a good teaching moment for the catechism class as well. Uh, so we'll, we'll consider that good catechesis as a, by way of example. Uh, this is Mother's Day weekend. A happy Mother's Day to uh, all of those uh, who have been blessed in this way and blessings as well. Uh, we certainly praise the Lord for your service uh, as Christian mothers. Uh, today we'll then continue with our hymn of invocation number 556, the first four stanzas. Exaltation springing, and with united heart and voice, sure singing, proclaim the wonders God has done. Firmly sin possessed me, my own good works all came to none. Of hell I suffered, but God had seen my wretched state before the world's foundation, and mindful of his mercies great, he planned for my salvation. He turned to me a father's heart. He did not choose the easy part, but gave his dearest treasure. We continue then with Confession and Absolution on page 151. Please rise. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness.
Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against You in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved You with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve Your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of Your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so we may delight in Your will and walk in Your ways to the glory of Your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in His mercy, has given His Son to die for You and for His sake forgives You all Your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by His authority, I therefore forgive You all Your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join in the entrance hymn number 556, the fifth stanza. It's time to have compassion and bright jewel of my crown and bring to all salvation from sin and sorrow set them free slay bitter death for them that they may live with you forever we continue with the curie in peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort in this time, this gracious Lord.
The first reading for the sixth Sunday of Easter is from Acts chapter 17. While Paul was waiting for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him as he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and the devout persons and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers also conversed with them. And some said, what does this babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a preacher of foreign divinities because he was preaching Jesus in the resurrection. And they took hold of him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, May we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? For you bring some strange things to our ears. We wish to know, therefore, what these things mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there would spend their time in nothing except telling or hearing something new. So Paul, standing in the midst of the Areopagus, said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in every way you are very religious. For as I passed along and observed the objects of your worship, I found also an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by man, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place, that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are indeed his offspring. Being then God's offspring, we ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm for today is the 66th psalm. It can be found in the very beginning of the hymnal. And we'll speak it responsively. By half verse, beginning at verse 8. Bless our God, O peoples. Let the sound of his praise be heard, who has kept our soul among the living and has not let our feet slip. For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water, yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. I will come into your house with burnt offerings. I will perform my vows to you, that which my lips uttered and my mouth promised when I was in trouble. I will offer to you burnt offerings and fattened animals with the smoke of the sacrifice of rams, I will make an offering of bulls and goats. Come and hear, all you who fear God. I will tell what he has done for my soul. I cried to him with my mouth, and high praise was on my tongue. If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But truly, God has listened. He is attentive to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God because he has not rejected my prayer or removed his steadfast love from me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The epistle is from 1 Peter chapter 3. Now, 
Who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone to heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise to the Alleluia. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. And Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. In a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated for the hymn of the day, number 556, stanzas 6 through 10.
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, today we are taking up the verse, Being then God's offspring, I ought not to think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by the art and imagination of man. And we're going to be taking up the theme that we are God's offspring. We are His offspring, first of all, in our creation. And as Christians, we are His offspring doubly so because of our redemption and our sanctification. We're going to talk about being children of God, being God's offspring. Today I had a funeral. Uh, this is my second sermon I'm preaching today. And it was a funeral up at our sister congregation, St. Peter's, for a woman by the name of Betty Miller. I'm not sure if any of you know her or not. And uh, as I was looking over the congregation filled with her, her children and her grandchildren and even great-grandchildren, and I think there may have even been some great-great-grandchildren there, uh, I was kind of surprised at, at the appearance of people in a lot of ways. Uh, first of all, you, you could see the family resemblance between some of the even great-grandchildren and the mother. She had these uh, two great-granddaughters that I'd met before at uh, her, uh, her uh, departed husband's funeral, and you know they, they look a lot like that grandmother, that great-grandmother. And even the ones that, you know, maybe didn't resemble her in the face still resembled her in other ways. Um, now, I'm not saying any fashion is right or any fashion is wrong. But as I was looking out on the group, I was sort of uh, surprised to see that just about everybody in, in all these generations was pretty clean cut, kind of well dressed. Now, don't get me wrong, Betty was, you know, the wife of a truck driver. It's not like she was some high, fancy lady. But every time I would go to see her, even when she was in the nursing home here at Algoma, she always had on a, a nice, neat cardigan that might have some embroidery or some uh, little beads on it. And she always had a string of pearls around her neck. And sure, wouldn't you know it, you know, a lot of the men had uh, ties on or jackets on. A lot of the women were wearing dresses. They kind of went after the grandmother, the great-grandmother, in terms of presenting themselves in a little bit more clean-cut way, which is not always the case. And again, not to say anything is right or wrong in this way. Uh, isn't this the case that... The influence of our families, including our mothers, maybe even especially our mothers, it influences the way that we look, right? Uh, who we are is reflected of who we come from. And so this is the case not only in our earthly lives, but this is the case also in our spiritual lives. And this is the case not only with our relationship to our mothers, but also with our relationship to God. As God's offspring, in a sense, we are His image. As it says in Genesis, that after the image of God, He created them. There's several things I'd like you to see about the fact that we, as God's offspring, as uh, bearing the image of God, uh, what this means for us. Uh, first of all, St. Paul in his sermon, as he preached it and as we read it today, uh, first of all, St. Paul indicates that because we bear God's image, that in a sense, we are without excuse, right? Uh, we ought to know that, that God is not like the various idols that we worship. 
we ought to be able to, in a sense, find God. As he says, yet he is actually not far from uh, each one of us, uh, and that they should seek God in the hope that they might feel their way toward him and find him. In a sense, we are without excuse in our rebellion against God and our failure in our sinfulness to worship God. Without excuse, for several reasons. In other places, St. Paul says that we are without excuse because of the knowledge of God. We have this innate knowledge, he said, that the invisible attributes of God have been always visible. For example, his wisdom and his knowledge, his power, his might, his goodness. Because of this, we're without excuse. In other places, St. Paul says that we are without excuse before the judgment seat of God, uh, not only because of the the knowledge that we ought to have of the divine being in, in the natural realm, but also on account of the fact of the law. Uh, The law holds all accountable. I mean, we all acknowledge the law. We all have an inner sense of the law, what the theologians call the natural knowledge of the law. And the fact that we violate God's law is a burden upon our consciences by which we all have to shut our mouths. We cannot justify ourselves. And as Saint, uh, or rather as C.S. Lewis said, if there is a law, a universal law, there must be a universal law giver. Finally, we are accountable to God not only on account of the knowledge of the law and the ability to perceive his, uh, his divine nature and his qualities in the natural world, but also just on account of knowing who we are. If we indeed are God's offspring, then we ought to know that God is not the various idols that we worship. So we're all accountable to God. And we're all all accountable to God for for the fact that we have failed to love him above all things. For the fact that we have, in fact, committed idolatry. You don't have to bow down in front of a golden calf in order to commit idolatry. But whenever we sin, we commit idolatry. Because whenever we sin, we show that the place in our hearts where God ought to be is occupied by something else. All of the things that the Lord has granted us in this world, in this created order, they're good gifts. And the Lord intends us to use these gifts in order to bless others and in a way which conforms to His will. Sadly, so often we get this wrong. Instead of using the gifts that the Lord has given us, instead we bow down to worship those gifts. Let's take, for example, let's say the example of our money. God has given us money and there's nothing inherently evil about money. Right? Jesus When he talked about money, he said, the root of all evil is not money. He said, the root of all evil is the love of money. God intended for us to use money for the sakes of others and uh, in conformity with his will. But instead of considering money a tool to be used to demonstrate his love towards others, to be Uh, a way that God extends His love toward others. Instead, very often, I believe all of us, have bowed down to money as 
something worthy in and of itself. Instead of using it to serve others, instead, use others to serve it. That's bowing down to the idol of money. What about recreation? It's a big thing in our area. Something that many of us treasure quite a bit. Our various hobbies and uh, these things of this nature. We spend big time on them. Big money on them. Costs a lot of money, for example, to uh, take a boat on the lake of Lake Michigan. Inherently wrong? By no means. Absolutely not. Recreation is something that can be done completely in conformity with God's will. Completely in conformity into the end of the love of the neighbor. Taking a little time to rest, taking a little time of enjoyment. These things aren't contrary to God's will. In fact, Christ Jesus himself turned wine, turned water into wine at the wedding feast in Cana. Christ himself took time to enjoy simple pleasures. Nothing inherently wrong with it. And yet, so many people have allowed their hobbies, their recreational activities, to, instead of serving them so that they might be refreshed, to then serve others, instead, exhaust themselves and harry themselves in order to serve those hobbies or recreational activities. Uh, let's take for example, uh, let, let's just talk for example about you know, those who maybe go into deep debt in order to purchase a piece of equipment. Now all of a sudden, fishing has become not something restful to you, but now it becomes something of an obligation. <laughs> Not only an obligation, but an obligation that you have to work hard in order to sustain. Whereas going and casting a line might have been an opportunity for refreshment. Instead, now you have to work and worry about big bills. And this activity of fishing, which ought to have been refreshing to you now has weighed you down with all kinds of anxieties all kinds of unease all kinds of unrest and now you're not able to serve your neighbor in the way that god desires you to do there's very few things in this world which are inherently evil God has created all things good. God desires us to use the good things that he gave us in obedience to him and service to the neighbor. Sadly, so often, we have ended up serving those good gifts and turning those good gifts into little g gods. That's what idolatry is all about. And the problem with this is that it completely subverts God's intended order. You, as his offspring, as God's image, you were made to be kings and queens over the rest of creation. And the rest of creation was to Intended by God to be under you, to serve you, and to be used by you to please Him and to serve each other. But what happens when we get this mixed up is that we, the image of God, instead of being kings and queens over these created goods, instead, 
we become servants underneath them. And we cause the very image of God to bow down in service to those things which ought to have been under Him. You see how that works? By us, His creatures, His offspring, serving the created things in idolatry, in a sense, this is blasphemy concerning the Lord God Himself. Praise be to God. The Lord God has seen fit to make us His offspring not just once, but twice. For brothers and sisters in Christ, those of us who have been baptized and believe have been given the new birth. And we have become children of God twice over. We've orphaned ourselves on account of our sin. But God has not left us as orphans. But instead has adopted us to be his dear children. He adopted us by sending his very son by nature to take on human flesh and to be one of us. God himself and his eternal son became our brother in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. And as our big brother, he has led us to new relationship with God. Jesus was tempted to, re to worship created things. Jesus was tempted to make a God out of the good gift of food, for example, in his temptations in the wilderness. He was tempted to make a little g God out of the riches of the kingdoms of the world. He was tempted in every single way that we have been tempted. And yet he was found faithful. Instead of worshiping these created goods as gods, instead he worshiped the Father above all things. Trusted him in above all things. He did what we have failed to do. And having died for us, he took the consequence that we have deserved on account of our idolatry. And brothers and sisters in Christ, when we, through baptism and faith, come into new relationship with God, we who have the forgiveness of sins are led by him to be God's children. And we, too, begin to have that family resemblance to the Father. Something which has begun in us imperfectly now, but will be brought to its completion in the time to come. But until that time, the new obedience has been begun in us and is increasing in us. My urging to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, is that you would seek to imitate Christ Jesus, your Lord, in his obedience to the Father, and his worship of the Father above all things. What are some practical ways you can do this? First of all, I encourage you, brothers and sisters in Christ, to pray. Prayer is an expression of trust in God. It's faith when it's on the lips. We are not orphans. We are God's beloved children. Now here's the thing about the difference between orphans and beloved children. 
Beloved children actually cry out to their mothers and to their fathers. <laughs> uh, there's document documentaries about orphanages in uh, the Soviet Union back in the Soviet times. Places which were drastically underfunded. And when you look at those documentaries, something that's very striking about them is just how quiet they were. Little children and little toddlers, they didn't cry. They didn't call out. Why? Because they knew that crying out wouldn't get them anything. It didn't benefit them. No one would come and check on them. When our children cry out, we go check on them, right? We go make sure they're dry, make sure they're fed, make sure they're safe. It didn't happen in those Soviet nurseries. In like matter, when I was in the military, I was told that there's only one thing worse than soldiers that are complaining to you all the time. The only thing worse than that is soldiers that aren't complaining to you because they've lost confidence in you as their leader. When we cry out to God in prayer, Lord, forgive me. Lord, thank you for your blessings. Lord, I pray that you would bless me in this, in this way, if it is your will. This is pleasing to God. Even as when an infant cries out for his mother, that's an expression of faith that that infant has for his mother. So also when we cry out to God in prayer, this is us living as his children. Brothers and sisters in Christ, pray. Second of all, brothers and sisters in Christ, I encourage you to spread the good news of the gospel to those who need to hear it. Because we are God's offspring by nature of our creation, all of humanity will be held accountable to God before His judgment seat. Therefore, all humanity needs to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So that through the gospel, their hearts would rise up in faith by the power of the Holy Spirit and become adopted children of God once more. No longer orphans. The greatest way you can do this is by leading a life of hope. And when others ask you about the hope that you display in your life, that you are ready to give an account of that hope. And to witness to the work that Jesus Christ has done for you. Finally, brothers and sisters in Christ, I encourage you to above all yourselves repent of your sins and look to Christ in faith. Because by means of this we turn away from the idolatry which all of us have committed on account of our sin and you receive the forgiveness of sins by which you become children of God. For if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are God's children. Let us allow that family resemblance to shine in us and through us as God's forgiven sons and daughters. We seek to use the blessings that he has given us in order to serve others and that we serve others above all in telling them about their Savior, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise to the Nicene Creed on page 158. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth,
that you have made us your children. In our creation, in our redemption, and sanctification. We pray, O oh Lord, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would transform our hearts, that we, instead of bowing down to worship created things, instead would worship you alone. That we would use your various blessings towards the ends that you have called us to be. Conformity with your will and in service to the neighbor. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. King of kings, Lord of lords, it is you who place into the hand of all those who bear it the sword of authority. And therefore, we pray to you on behalf of our president and governor, our courts, and our legislature. Through their work, we might be enabled to lead lives of peace and quietness. We also especially lift up to you this day all those who put themselves in harm's way for us, our soldiers, sailors, airmen, and marines, our police officers, firefighters, paramedics, and EMTs. Keep them safe even as they keep us safe. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, in you we live and move and have our being. You are therefore closer to us than we are even to ourselves. And so we lift up all the cares and concerns of our hearts. We pray to you, therefore, on behalf of the homeless, the hospitalized, the imprisoned, and the hungry, that you would fill up in them whatever was needed. Bless as well all those who need your special care within this congregation, remembering especially your servants, Jim Engelking, Bob Musil, Bill Wilbert, and Jolly Jeffrey. Bless as well all of those who mourn the death of David Sayre. Grant them confidence and peace and knowledge of the resurrection. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things are ever else to know that the means grant us, Lord, through your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please remain standing as we sing the offertory on page 159 and the offering of God's word.
essentially God his Son, he took our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentance, we receive the salvation accomplished for us, the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gather in the name and the remembrance of Jesus. We beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, to the end of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb, this kingdom which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be our glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke and he gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. The same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you. For forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. and preserve you in body and soul for life everlasting. Amen. body of Christ given for you, the true body of Christ given for you. Thank you. 
We give thanks to Almighty God that you have refreshed us through the salutary gift. We implore you that of your mercy you'd strengthen us to the same in faith toward you and for love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. 